Thank you for joining us today for the 2023 Jeff Jensen Endowed Research Award and Lecture. I want to start by thanking Ash Ahrens, who makes the magic happen behind these events. Thank you, Ash, for pulling this all together. Um, and to welcome those of you who are here to join us in person, so many familiar faces, um, and those that are joining virtually, because we're now in the time of hybrid events. So welcome to you all. It's great to see familiar faces. For those that don't know me, my name's Kim Bender. I'm serving as acting dean for the Graduate School of Social Work, and it's my pleasure to introduce our event today and then to join you at the end for some Q&A with Dr. Bellamy. So before I do that, um, I want to take a moment to acknowledge our relationship with the land and its original peoples. The University of Denver and the Graduate School of Social Work exist upon the unceded ancestral territories of the Cheyenne, the Ute, the Arapaho, and the Sioux. We're joined in person today by Jeff Jensen, who made this award and lecture series possible. And before I introduce this year's award recipient, I wanna talk a little bit about Jeff um, and what he's contributed to our community. Um, this award and the lecture series it's inspired are as significant as they are because of Jeff. His leadership and career he's had here at the University of Denver are distinctive and far ranging. His work has grounded both research practice and spoke to the drive that we use to utilize research to create social change. So I'm gonna start and give you a bit of a bio on Jeff. Jeff is the Philip and Eleanor Wynn Endowed Professor Emeritus at the Graduate School of Social Work and served as a faculty member from 1998 to 2020. His research and teaching focuses on the application of a public health approach to preventing child and adolescent health and behavior problems and on the evaluation of preventative interventions aimed at promoting healthy youth development. Dr. Jenna Denson has published eight books and numerous articles and chapters on the topic of child and adolescent development and prevention science. His books include Preventing Child and Adolescent Problem Behavior, Evidence-Based Strategies in Schools, Families, and Communities from 2014, although I, I have secret knowledge that I think there's another edition coming out soon, and Social Policy for Children and Families, A Risk and Resilience Perspective in 2022, which was the recipient of the Best Edited Book Award from the Society for Research on Adolescence. Dr. Jensen's the former chair of the Coalition for the Promotion of Behavioral Health and a co-author of the Unleashing the Power of Prevention, a comprehensive framework published by the National Academy of Medicine that helps communities and states implement tested and effective preventative interventions. He's the re recipient of the Distinguished Career Achievement Award and the Aaron Rosen Award from the Society for Social Work and Research and the Distinguished Scholar and University Lecture Awards from the University of Denver. Dr. Jensen is a former editor-in-chief of the Journal of the Society for Social Work and Research and previously served on the boards of both the Society for Social Work and Research and the Society for Prevention Research. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare and the Society for Social Work and Research. Dr. Jensen was appointed as Emeritus Professor at the University of Denver in June 2020. It's kind of nice to get to talk about that because we didn't get to have a retire. We didn't get to have a retirement event in your honor um, during the pandemic. Thank you, Jeff, for joining us today, for you and Mary to be here and for continuing to support the research of our esteemed faculty here. Now I'm going to shift gears and talk about those faculty. Um, last year, for the first event of this type, um, we honored Dr. Heather Tausig who explored a conversation about 20 years of her experience with intervention research. And this year's recipient, Professor Jennifer Bellamy, will take us down a different road, one that explores how the unexpected can be welcome visitors and how embracing the unforeseen in research can lead to richer and more dynamic outcomes. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Bellamy and then I'll hand the mic over to her. Dr. Jennifer Bellamy is the Associate Dean for Research and Faculty Development and Professor at the Graduate School of Social Work at the University of Denver. At GSSW, she teaches research courses. And as a clinical social worker, she worked as a crisis counselor at the University of Texas and served as a project coordinator for the Texas Fragile Families Initiative, which was a multi-site demonstration project serving young unmarried low-income fathers. Dr. Bellamy completed her PhD at the Columbia University School of Social Work in 2006 and postdoctoral training at the George Warren Brown School of Social Work at Washington University in St. Louis in 2008. Her current research and scholarship focuses on the engagement of fathers in child and family services and evidence-based practice in social work. She's currently the principal investigator 
on the Administration for Children and Families Funded Fathers and Continuous Learning in Child Welfare Project in partnership with Mathematica Policy Research. And she's also a co-PI investigator for an ACF funded Colorado Fatherhood Project in partnership with the Colorado Office of Early Childhood. Dr. Bellamy is the co-developer of the Dads Matter HV and the Nurturing Dads and Partners programs. It's with great pleasure that I welcome to the podium, Dr. Jennifer Bellamy. Hey, thank you, Kim, for the lovely introduction and, and thanks, Jeff, really, for making this possible. Um, I so admire you and your work, and so receiving this award is really quite special. Um, so today I'm going to talk with you about balancing intention and chance, welcoming unplanned possibilities and flexibility in research. And I'm going to start by showing you what I thought my career trajectory was going to look like. Step one, I will get my PhD. Step two, I will become a faculty member. Step three, I will develop interventions for fathers and their families. So this is what I had parked in my brain, along with a lot of fun assumptions. My husband's actually here in the audience. Um, this included the assumption that I would have my summers off. That was a good one. <laughs> for those of you um, who are academics, you know, uh, that's a pretty um, off assumption. So this is what I had parked in my brain. And this is a better representation of actually what things <laughs> turned out to look like. Um, and there have been points of frustration along the way, for sure. But at the end of the day, this is a much more interesting picture to look at. And that's kind of the broader theme of what I wanted to come and speak with you about today. So early in my career and, and often, and I know there are doctoral students in the audience as well, so um, you may appreciate this, especially as you start to prepare uh, for the job market. But oftentimes we're asked to talk about what's your five-year plan? What is it that you are going to do when you join this faculty? And I actually searched around some of my uh, electric files trying to find um, my job talk for my faculty position because I'm pretty sure there was a slide that looked almost exactly like this. So I said in the next five years, um, and Heather Tosig, our, our uh, former recipient of this award, will appreciate too, talking about 20 years of research. Um, what I presented to be my five-year plan was really, really overly ambitious, <laughs> first of all. <laughs> um, these things take a lot of time. Um, but I, what I said is I want to develop an intervention for fathers. Um, I want to get NIMH funding to pilot test to that intervention. And then I want to get a big NIMH grant. Uh, with multi-million dollar uh, level funding, and that, that was the grand plan. But even before I got uh, to implementing that plan, or at least trying to, I started my PhD program with really that idea parked in the back of my brain. And I was fortunate enough to get a pre-doctoral fellowship from the National Institute of Mental Health was really exciting. And back then, um, many PhD programs actually didn't financially support um, their students or didn't fully do so. So a lot of us would compete for these fellowships in order to be able to fund um, our education. And I was super excited to, to get one of these fellowships at Columbia University. And I was assigned uh, to my advisor, uh, Edward Mullen, who's emeritus at Columbia now. And I, as, as Kim mentioned, was just coming off of my clinical practice doing mental health services um, for the University of Texas. I was doing this demonstration project in, in Texas, and I walked in the door very excited to start studying with Dr. Mullen. And the first thing he said to me was, what do you think about evidence-based practice? And I said, evidence-based, what? <laughs> I honestly had never heard of this. Unbeknownst to me at the time, um, uh, Dr. Mullen was, was one of the leaders in the effort to bring this idea of evidence-based practice from medicine into social work. And his, his early work actually was a part of the, the background or the history, the context that brought us to the conversation of evidence-based practice. 
he did a lot of research in the 60s and 70s um, that actually called into question whether or not social work actually worked. Did we really get the outcomes that we purported to get and could we demonstrate that effectiveness through research? And a lot of his work actually pointed to the answer, no. Now, that, those studies um, have been critiqued for, for a lot of reasons. They were lumping together lots of different types of interventions that had different types of outcomes. Um, and so you, you, can, you can pull that apart um, if you like. But that larger conversation of how do we take research evidence and get it to the places where we hope to be helpful. So to the communities, to the service providers, to the families. And he was really keenly interested in that question and its evolution over time. And so this was the early 2000s and what we were talking about was evidence-based practice. And I really wanted to be pleasing to my advisor and I really wanted him to appreciate me and um, feel that I was a part of his team and contributing. So that led to my first tangent <laughs> off of my grand plan. So step one was not going to be developing an intervention. And there were other reasons that I probably shouldn't have started developing an intervention my first year as a doc student. We could pick that apart later, but we'll just go with this one for now. Um, so evidence-based practice, I mean, it was an interesting conversation. And I was there's a there was a lot that I had to learn about that. And I benefited from his mentoring in many, many ways that at the time I really didn't appreciate. In the moment I was a little frustrated, shall we say, because I came into my doctoral program with a passion. There was a reason that I wanted to get that training and it wasn't evidence-based practice. But, uh, you know, got through that um, a lot of important skills that turns out were critically important to my ability to implement the other pieces of what I had in mind. I just didn't know it at the time. So even though it felt like a tangent and it felt like something that wasn't part of my plan, it turned out to be a really great thing. So there were lessons that came out of this. So Ed Mullen and I, along with some other doctoral students, set out to try to implement the evidence-based practice process with community partners in New York City. And at the time, no one had really tried to do that before. A lot of the efforts around evidence-based practice were really about implementing evidence-supported interventions in practice. But if you're familiar with the evidence-based practice process model, you know it's a lot more than that. It actually is about client decision-making and taking into consideration research evidence, but also balancing that with contextual factors and also the capacity of the people providing service to actually implement whatever supports or programs um, they're uh, aiming to provide. So in working with these community partners, I, I pulled a few important lessons that have sort of echoed forward and skills as well in how to do this community engaged work. Um, and I thought it was very clever with these icons that I made. I'm actually not that skilled with PowerPoint slide deck, <laughs> but what I meant to represent here with the little pictures are relationships. So when we walked into those community partnerships in New York City, um, I'm a first year doctoral student. I really didn't know what the heck I was doing. <laughs> and I was asking providers to trust me, to let me into their world um, and so that we could work together to try to figure out how do you implement the evidence-based practice process in practice. And that took a lot of time. And it took a lot of relational skills that um, I thought I was quite good at as a clinician, but they're really different. Engaging in community-based research is relational, but it's relational in a different way than it is to be a social work clinician. And I had to figure that out. It also takes a lot of time. So this is not the sort of thing that you can get into and out of. And I've come to a place over the years where that is uh, not only uh, problematic in terms of getting the work done. It's problematic vis-a-vis -vis our relationship 
with the folks that we partner with to do research. We have a responsibility to each other. And so unfortunately, historically, a lot of community engaged research has involved a researcher sort of popping in and popping out of community instead of caring for those relationships over time. And that's resulted in a lot of frustration and a lot of potential community partners that I've wanted to work with telling me no, because they didn't trust that I was going to be there for the long haul. And that was another really important lesson. And then the third one that I want to highlight with the little puzzle pieces, and this will come back around again, is that the research evidence that we had at the time was woefully inadequate to the needs of the communities that I was partnering with. It didn't reflect realistic sort of service conditions. A lot of the research on evidence-supported interventions was developed for efficacy trials. So they were very well-resourced uh, studies where they had highly trained clinicians with a lot of time to focus on a specific intervention, not pulled in a million directions. A lot of the samples didn't reflect the people that were being served by the agencies that I was working with. And so the fit between the research and the places of practice, my partners, was, was not a good one. And that's really stuck in my head over time. Edward Mullen was a really important voice and one that uh, has been sort of a model for scholarship and also the way that you bring um, new students or new researchers into practice. And I'll be forever grateful for his positive impact on my career. Um, but there were a lot of other voices in the mix. Some were not so positive. <laughs> Edward Mullen is a cheerleader and he's a supporter and he's like, that's a great idea. Why don't you try it out? He's that type of mentor. But I've been um, in conversation, in mentoring relationships even that were not uh, so positive. And this quote comes from one of them. I'm not going to name this person. Um, but I, uh, in my effort to get NIMH funding, would sign up to do these um, trainings, like summer trainings that were supported by NIH to sort of learn how to speak the language of an NIH grant and how could I take my ideas about father interventions of development and put that into a place where it would be funded. Um, so I went to one of these summer things and was very excited. And I laid out um, a small research grant, an RO3, if you speak uh, NIH, you know what I'm talking about. These are little smaller grants. Um, and the mentor that I was matched with um, said, this is a very nice idea, but what if it turns out fathers don't matter to outcomes? <laughs> You're telling me that my dream thing that brought me to a PhD gave up a very nice house with a yard and a well-paying job in San Antonio to move to New York City <laughs> to implement what I thought was going to be fatherhood research only to learn evidence-based practice. And now you're telling me maybe fathers don't matter. Um, took me a minute to recover from that. But I think many of us find that some of those voices of critique and more negative um, appraisals in the end make us stronger. They sharpen our arguments. They point to the places where we can strengthen our work. And also I found it strengthened my resolve. So yeah, I got a little disappointed and I got a little frustrated in the moment, but I picked myself up and I said, okay, fine. Maybe that's what we need to do. And to be fair at this time, 20 years ago, we didn't have a lot of research evidence on how and why fathers mattered to families to service engagement, uh, to mom's participation in services. And so uh, my work took another little tangent <laughs> to try to build the case for what was my original three-step plan. How could we build research that indicated that dads matter um, and so that I could leverage funding so that people would be interested in investing in my original ideas? So this was quickly turning into something that was not a five-year plan. This is going to take a lot more time. 
this is the work that I started um, as a postdoc at WashU. And at the same time, I in part got that postdoc in WashU because Edward Mullen was so good at training me in evidence-based practice. And Enola Proctor at WashU was really into evidence-based practice and the newly emerging related conversation around implementation science. So that was a, a tangent that I hadn't planned on taking, but actually really well prepared me to take advantage uh, of that postdoc. And in that moment, I learned a lot about um, additional factors that determine whether or not evidence-supported interventions are successful in practice. What does it take in terms of the implementation context? How do you ready systems and environments so that they can take up a new intervention? And what does that look like? All the while building off of a lot of secondary data analysis projects, mind you, um, that case for why fathers matter. And I wanna say 20 years on, we have a lot of evidence now that fathers matter. And frankly, this I knew in my heart. So for those of you pulled into research because you had a passion, something that you knew was important and you felt it in your heart, um, sometimes the research evidence isn't there yet, um, but we keep chipping uh, away. So I've used data from the, National Survey of Child and Adolescent Well-Being, the Fragile Families and Child Well-Being Study out of um, New York, um, and several others uh, that have really painted a picture of fathers and their importance. And so now we're beyond this question of do fathers matter? Yes, they matter. They matter in lots of ways. They matter in ways that are distinct um, from mothers, and they matter in the family system overall. And a piece of this that I want to layer on, I spent so much time trying to convince people that dads are important and we should be paying attention to them and fighting that good fight. And that fight is still being fought, <laughs> let me tell you now. It's baked into systems that are very mother-focused, such as child welfare, where I continue to do work today. Um, but the piece that I've layered on much more recently is that fathers matter for themselves. Like we should want to help dads, not just because they're helpful for kids, not just because when moms are struggling, dads are extra important, not just because the family will stay engaged in services longer because the fathers are also engaged, but fathers matter for themselves and we should be interested in them as individuals and as whole people as well. So all of this is happening in a very busy context with a lot of expectation and committee service and learning how to teach. I know I was never really taught how to teach. <laughs> that was a process over time. And so um, as I moved from my postdoc into my first faculty position, um, I felt like I was spending a whole lot of time trying to tick off boxes trying to make sure I had enough publications, showing that I could pursue external funding, all of these kind of performance indicators, if you will, that I honestly was um, highly concerned about for really reasonable reasons with tenure and those kind of things, you're trying to keep your job. So those performance indicators are important, but somewhere along the way, I, I lost the focus on the passion and what had brought me into doing the work in the first place. And so, yeah, I got a lot of secondary data analysis publications and things like that, but I was ticking boxes and running here and everywhere trying to show that I was a good performing faculty member. And I had a conversation uh, with a colleague of mine, Ramesh Raghavan. Um, we had met at, at WashU and stayed in touch over, over the years. And I said to him, I don't know if this is for me. I don't know if I can keep doing this and performing and performing. And he said, I think you sort of forgot like what you were trying to accomplish in the beginning. And you're spending so much time running around ticking off boxes. You're not giving your yourself a chance to be creative. And he said to me, ours is inherently a creative endeavor. And what that takes is space and time to think. And I hadn't protected space and time for myself 
to think, and I was so worried about ticking off boxes, it wasn't happening. So I, whether the universe brought it to me or I just was open to it at the time, I had another conversation with a colleague who's become an important mentor of mine, um, Neil Guterman, who former uh, dean at Chicago, who also happened to be the doctoral program director at Columbia when I was a student there. So I've known him for many, many years. Um, a funding opportunity came across his desk and he said, Jen, I think you and I could partner on this together. It's for supporting interventions for fathers across the field, building the research evidence in that area. And I was like, oh my gosh, yes, let's pursue this together. So we spent some good protected time together just thinking about what this project could look like. And I realized I hadn't done that in a really long time. It really hadn't been since my postdoc that I just had the luxury of sitting down and being creative and thinking about what could be next. And weirdly, this grant opportunity was the thing that made the space for that to happen. Sadly, we did not get that funding. <laughs> but I'm grateful still for the opportunity because what we ended up doing was really blueprinting, re-blueprinting really these three steps that I had in mind. The other piece of this is I had always thought of it um, as my research, my steps. And working with Neil, I realized, nope, this is gonna be our research, our steps. The other piece that I didn't have in place was a team. The University of Chicago, if you haven't been there before, the building uh, is a Mies van der Rohe, famous architect, very famous. And the way Mies, um, if I may call him Mies, like we're tight. <laughs> Design the building, it's, it's really cool, but all the classrooms are on the top level. They have these beautiful, huge glass windows. They look out onto the trees of the midway of the University of Chicago. And the offices for the faculty are in the basement. There are no windows, they're tiny, they're like cubicles. Um, and the lore was, I have no idea if this was true or not, but that um, Mies van der Rohe felt this was what faculty needed for creativity was to be in a very small dark box with no distraction. And it couldn't have been a better metaphor for what was going on with my own work. I was in a very small tight box and I wasn't getting out there and finding collaborators and giving myself space to come up with that creativity. Um, and so here we go. Lessons learned <laughs> in that work. So what Neil and I blueprinted was what was to become the Dad's Matter in home visiting um, intervention. And we've done a lot of work on this intervention over the years. Um, my icons here, again, <laughs> representing some key lessons learned. But the first one was, um, that a lot of the evidence supported interventions, what I had dreamed of creating were um, manual based. And one of the complaints from the field at the time was that it robs the flexibility out of your work with clients, that it tells you do this step one, step two, step three, step four. Um, and that was frustrating when social workers were working with clients that had a lot of different needs and a lot of different expectations. And they felt they couldn't be flexible. So one of the innovations that we came up with with Dad's Matter was a modular approach. Okay, maybe it isn't step one, step two, step three, but we like the idea, what manuals do is help you understand what an intervention is and what it isn't, helps you support its quality. So we don't wanna lose those pieces, but we wanna intentionally build some flexibility into the process. The other thing um, that we did was articulate places where uh, users of the intervention could make their own changes. So what was important to, to leave intact and then what were the ways that they could be flexible? So for example, when we did the early pilot work, uh, with we talked with mothers, we talked with fathers, we talked with service providers and home visiting. And, um, one of the things we puzzled around was whether we should engage mothers and fathers together or separately. And a lot of the fatherhood work at the time, dads were sort of in a separate intervention on the sides. The idea was 
serve moms through standard home visiting and then have like a special support group for dads or something like that on the side. And the parents said to us, no, 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 no. <laughs> we just had a baby together. We want to be together in the service. This is a family thing. And I say it now and it sounds like kind of silly, but that's unfortunately a lot of the way that fatherhood work has continued to be is adjunctive or on the side. So another important innovation in this work was really to put the family to, together and let them tell us who should be involved in the intervention. So we don't decide. And sometimes, even though families have just had a baby together, um, they don't get along. They don't want to be in a room together or something's going on that geographically makes it hard to have both of them in the, in the same room at the same time. We had dads working out on a rig in the Gulf or in prison um, or moms otherwise unavailable. So we start with asking families, who do you want to be involved in the intervention? Then we offer tailored opportunities for the intervention providers to put the intervention together in the way that makes sense for that family. And so this was a way to get at some of those issues that I was noticing before in that evidence-based practice work with Edward Mullen about the puzzle pieces. We know things are complicated. So maybe a lockstep manual approach isn't the way to go, but something like a modular approach might be better. And Neil always liked to say, <laughs> And he still says this. We still meet weekly <laughs> together because the Dads Matter HB work continues on. He'd like to say chance favors the prepared. And I was pretty sure he did not make this up. So I actually, for this talk, looked this up. I was like, where does this quote come from? Turns out um, it's like a not great quote, but close to something Louis Pasteur said. In the fields of observation, chance favors only the prepared mind. Good sentiment also, <laughs> which I uh, appreciated. But all that prep work that we did to try to get that initial funding really then made everything else fall into place because we had that plan. And we were able to take those ideas to funders um, in Chicago. So I'm letting go of my NIMH dream of having that vein of funding and staying centered on what is it that we're trying to do. So our early work, I always thought this was really um, entertaining. Our early work was funded by foundations that were very food oriented. The Oscar Mayer Foundation, the McCormick, yes, the Spice people <laughs> in Chicago um, funded our early work. Later, we were able to get some larger foundations to invest um, in this work as well. And this what's becoming a pretty messy sketch at this point, it's 15 years of work, what I thought I was gonna do in, in five in a very linear fashion. And now we have the Dads Matter um, home visiting intervention that has some of those cool uh, innovations that really embrace that flexibility, that embrace the things that we can't predict about um, families. And another piece of this that I wanna highlight for you in that theme of flexibility and sort of going with things that you can't so much predict or understand as the, it's very hard to read, I think, this text. But in the front end of this, you'll see there's a circle there. So one of the challenges in fatherhood work is, is that idea that fathers are on the side. Another challenge is that we would encounter folks who wanted to serve fathers. Then they would do an assessment with a family and they would say, well, there's domestic violence. We can't work with him oh, he's involved in substance use stuff, or he's a drug dealer. There were all these like risks and things that people were worried about. And we can talk a lot about the biases, by the way, um, involved in this, the intersections of race and gender and income for sure. But another thing was, is like, they were assessing dad once and then sort of writing him off. Like he's a bad actor. We can't bring him into the service. And so we uh, created instead this, cycle within the intervention. If dad's not able to be served with this intervention right now, let's put things in place to support him and get him to a place where he can participate or intervene with a family so that they can participate together. And I'm super excited to say <laughs> that we are well on our way to becoming that evidence-supported intervention that I had parked in my brain. And the Dads Matter HB intervention has demonstrated 
not just increased engagement of fathers in home visiting, which historically has been very, very poor. Um, we've demonstrated improved mother-father relationship quality, reduced stress for both mothers and fathers, increased father involvement with their kids, and reduced risk for child maltreatment. And this research is coming out. We just had one in um, prevention science, and we'll have another one soon focusing on those child maltreatment prevention outcomes. And then we get to the part where we really go <laughs> off what I had planned and didn't think about or see coming. And no, Sting is not a personal mentor of mine, <laughs> if only. Uh, but I thought this quote was kind of fun and fit the sentiment. If you love somebody, set them free. And this has been really hard. So Dad's Matter HB at this point is kind of like my baby. Um, but it, we're in the process of getting that intervention out into the field and also allowing it to continue to be adapted. So a couple of examples there, the Nurturing Dads and Partners program, which um, Kim mentioned in her introduction, is a project here in Colorado where we integrated Dads Matter HB with another fatherhood intervention, Nurturing Fathers, and we're testing that out across seven sites um, in the state of Colorado. And I'm also working with a um, psychologist who's at the University of Pittsburgh who wants to adapt the intervention specifically for urban black fathers. And the cool thing about this has been those projects are generating all these interesting new ideas and learnings and improvements for Dads Matter HB that we're feeding back into the intervention. So actually by letting it go, expanding our circle, to have you been more collaborators, take things in ways that I would never come up with myself, um, we're benefiting further. So this picture is getting pretty wild now, <laughs> but it continues to grow. So there's that adaptation work and that expansion and partnership with lots of other people. And I hope that continues. I, I would love to see Dads Matter HB go out into the world and continue to evolve in different ways. But I wanted to mention another project that I think is going to have important and continued implications as well, which is the Breakthrough Series Collaborative. Now, this one, if you can follow these lines, like you're going to get a prize, but let me just walk you through the connection here. <laughs> so the Breakthrough Series Collaborative is a continuous learning model whereby you use research evidence for practice decision-making. Sound familiar? Like evidence-based practice, the process. <laughs> but you do it on a systems level. And I learned about this Breakthrough Series Collaborative because a colleague of mine at Mathematica was interested in partnering on a father and child welfare project where the federal government, our federal partners, Administration for Children and Families, wanted us to try out a continuous learning approach in order to try to get things moving with father engagement and child welfare. It's been a problem for a really long time, um, and the field just wasn't changing. So their thought was, Let, let's try continuous learning. So I have been speaking evidence-based practice processes and evidence-supported interventions, and then in the Breakthrough Series Collaborative, they say, let that stuff go in large measure. What we want to do in the beginning is build a collaborative change framework where, yes, you look at the research evidence. So there's researchers in the room. Like, we could hang out together and build a vision, a collaborative change framework for something. It's really meant to be used for sticky problems that in art really living within systems and can't otherwise be easily shifted by a single intervention. So this actually came out of medicine as well to address sticky problems like hospital infection rates and has since been used in education and child welfare to address other sticky problems like engaging fathers and paternal relatives in that system. So you gather researchers to bring that research knowledge into this vision building process, but you also gather people with lived experience. So fathers and paternal relatives, frontline workers in child welfare, mid-level supervisors, trainers, data people, 
and we all get to come together and build a collaborative change framework. So that manual goes out the window <laughs> and it felt so scary to me. Like we completely have left the processes that I had been building my work on for the last 20 years and now we're doing something completely different. We work in these teams, we have the shared learning environment, that collaborative change framework, it doesn't even stay set. It evolves over the course of the Breakthrough Series Collaborative. And we have coaches along the way and data from the Model for Improvement are metrics that track whether we're getting the outcomes we want to see moving in the right direction in the system in a continuous way. So completely different from like a uh, clinical trial where we study things for like two, three, four, five years, and then sort of lift off the lid and say, did it work or not? This is continuous and the data is fed through in a continuous way. And I was like, mind blown. <laughs> so it, in many ways, it brings together those issues of fitting the evidence with the context. So in the Breakthrough Series Collaborative, each team uses different evidence. They're focusing on different things. The intervention doesn't look the same in every place. It takes time and relationships. And we're focused here on engaging fathers and paternal relatives in the process, but that little red planet -y thing going on out there is that system piece that you really have to get in, let go, and let it do its magic. So overall, told you a lot of stories, gave you lots of examples. But I, when I was reflecting on this talk, really what emerged for me at the end of the day is that um, there, there was a vision, there was a passion. And at the center of my work, that really was retained. But I let life happen. I let research happen and many people into that space and the messiness of it really at the end of the, the day, I think has created a much richer line of work. So it may not be plan A or plan B or plan C that gets you to where you're at. And I'm expecting D, E, and F. Um, I'm just, you know, many years yet into my career. Um, but I do think that retaining that vision was what, what kept me doing the work because it is a marathon. It's, it's not a sprint. And so that evidence-based practice tangent could have been a complete departure and that might've been where I built my work. But really um, what was important is I was able to bring it back to that center of what I wanted to do and let those tangents be enriching rather than pulling me off the mark at the end of the day. So it was very fun to tell you all these stories um, and share with you some of the reflection and the learning that I had along the way. I think the plan now is to do some Q&A. So thank you. Yeah. So my understanding is that I'm just gonna have a roving plank for the same amount of questions, and then I might start in that one. And you had such a calm presence today, which is so refreshing. Can I just want to a little bit to talk yeah. about how you, yeah, sort of what was happening internally? Like, what was the process, reflective process, as you were sort of pivoting from the plan yeah. to sort of take in new collaborators and information that took you in new directions? Yeah, I um, like to say, and whether or not this is a healthy thing to say or not, because I think you're very good to say, pull back the curtain a little. I like to say, I like to maintain the thin veneer. <laughs> so I tend to project calmness, even when things, or maybe even more so when things are not calm. Um, there were definitely points, um, certainly in my PhD program, it happens less now, earlier in my career where I was like, oh, this was a mistake. 
I should not have done this. And some of it, I think I could trace back to disappointment. Like, this is what I thought things were going to be like. This is what I thought would happen in my PhD program, in my postdoc, in my assistant professor years. And then when it wasn't, it felt really disappointing. And it made me question whether or not this path made any sense. I have lots of like fantasies about second careers that involve, you know, like selling purses that are from Mexico at this shop that's only available in Mexican malls. And I want to bring the store here to the United States. Um, so I think one, it's okay, like to have a moment of crisis where you're thinking, maybe this was not the way to go. Because for me and letting myself think that and have conversations with friends who maybe were struggling with similar things, certainly my husband has heard me <laughs> process out loud, um, puts a clarity around, again, okay, why was it that I chose this path? What is it I'm trying to do? And I think those moments of questioning are actually the things that solidify your commitment to the work. Excellent answer. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Danny. Um, I've been thinking in your talk, thank you, Jen, for the yeah. talk, it was great. Um, I've been thinking partly, largely with the help of doc students, right, who, who are an important part of my own thinking about the speed yeah. with which we deliver our results. And I heard you indict speed in there, right, the, the uh, clinical trial for two or three years and moving on. And, and it's been disturbing me. I, and I, it, just as your talk, I was in your talk, I was thinking about it, that maybe it was okay a century ago for science to take 10 or 20 years. Um, but is that still okay in a, in amidst a technological revolution uh, where information comes very, very quickly and things become outdated in five or seven years? And so I would just love to hear your thoughts about um, your journey mm -hmm. and speed and our relevance as researchers uh, who are engaged in uh, a, a relatively slow process compared to the speed of life that that um, we're surrounded by. Yeah, there's a lot <laughs> there in what you said, and and I would layer on to say the increasing um, expectations of performance that are also placed on doctoral students, on faculty to to pump out publications, to teach a lot of classes, to um perform in those ways um so in some ways we're getting pressure to go faster um as a demonstration of our worth or value and then also intervention work takes a, a really long time and i didn't i didn't say this in my talk but it certainly was in my head that i was told do not do intervention work before you have tenure like you will seriously slow yourself down because you're not able to develop publications um, at the speed at which you need to in order to get tenure. And yet, um, working with, with community agencies uh, who were like, hang out with you for five years to do a randomized controlled trial to find out at the end whether or not this thing works. <laughs> and I'm gonna spend hours and, you know, so there are all these, um, tensions pulling in, all, in a lot of different directions. And I think in this moment of time, and probably for many reasons that you mentioned, um, it's a real struggle. And I think people get mixed messages in that. And we have to think um, about, well, how do we make space for people to think deeply and uh, elevate the importance of tackling problems that do take a long time to solve while also honoring our partners are trying to serve their community right now. So I think we need kind of like it all, right? So yeah, we, randomized control trials are still really valuable because they're a, a great way to, you know, or the gold standard way really to establish whether or not an intervention works. And yet there's space for the breakthrough series collaborative type models 
where you're continuously feeding evidence back into decision making in real time. Um, and maybe <laughs> with a really, really large randomized control trial, we could even look at the BSC um, as a model for that and see if we get the outcomes that that we we hope we do. That research evidence is still pretty like at an early stage, but um wrapped up in all of that is like what expectations do we put um, on ourselves and our students and our colleagues in being a part of that? Do you have to do all of the things? Can you do some of them? Is it okay to move really slowly? And I think we're having this conversation right now as a community to try to figure out uh, how to accommodate those tensions, but it's truly difficult right now, I think, because of all of those things coming together. Hello. Hi. Um, I am really sitting with when you um, kind of mentioned the unnamed person who told you um, research with dad, like, why does it matter? And I'm just curious in knowing as you kind of like move through both your education and your career, um, how did you ground yourself like in knowing that the work that you're doing is important and is relevant, even if those that are like mentors and like those that you look to are telling you that it doesn't. Yeah, it was, it was really hard. Um, I, one thing at that time that, that helped, um, so, you know, this was like 15, 20 years ago, um, was building a community around myself that shared that same value and conviction. And they really have gotten me through it. So one of the things that I did, um, maybe my first or second year as an assistant professor was to start a special interest group at the Society for Social Work and Research focused on people who want to do fatherhood research. Because um, I was like this I was like stalking that much, <laughs> trying to get that. <laughs> so I would like search the program for anyone that said anything about fathers. And back then there weren't very, there. I found five and I emailed every single one of them. And I said, can we hang out? <laughs> um, that group still exists now and now it's big. And there are students of, of those folks. Um, so I think to the extent that you can make your community in, if you're living in a context where that community is not naturally put around you, which, I mean, I, I think a lot of doctoral students are breaking such new ground, there isn't the obvious community. Um, and if you don't know how to do that, like, that's the kind of thing, like, I would hang out with you. We, let's make a plan. Let's, let's build your community so that you have that support because you are going to get, I had, I had someone unnamed, tell me social workers have no business doing intervention research. I had the fathers don't matter thing. Fathers are dangerous. You could invite them, but they're not going to come. You're a white woman trying to work with fathers of color. You like a lot of things that were telling me I had no business doing what I was doing. And so having those counterbalances in place are critical to get you through. Yeah. I think Jeff maybe had. Okay, speak right into it. Hey, thanks, Jen. That was just really great. It resonated. I think that's a little too close here. Um, you need me to speak? Yeah, you do. Um, yeah, it resonated really well with me and I'm sure a lot of our colleagues' careers and what we've encountered, the steps and the detours and such. And really interesting to hear you put your journey together. Um, I'm wondering if uh, if the Dads Matters teams now, are you doing anything at the policy level now to try to, to create changes based on the evidence you've generated and others have generated? and. Um, and I'll just preface that with, in, in the last years of my career, I spent a lot of time going with prevention scientists to different states to try and, you know, basically increase the scale up preventive interventions for behavioral health problems. And it was a really hard go, um, in part because in this country, we tend to 
underfund prevention, as you as you well know. And, but I'm curious if what your experiences have been there, or are you headed there uh, mm -hmm. in terms of bringing some of these this knowledge to scale and changing policy as well as practice? That's a great question. Actually, kind of a funny side note. So um, that grant that Neil and I didn't end up getting was for the Fatherhood Research and Practice Network, <laughs> which ended up being led by Jay Fagan and um, I'm forgetting her name, uh, who's a co-PI. But anyway, the, the purpose of, of that work was in part to do the policy work to try to build the research evidence around fatherhood um, and then translate that into policy, advocacy, these kind of things. Um, and that work is ongoing and Dads Matter ended up being part, in part funded by the Fatherhood Research and Practice Network. Um, and I think it um, ha hasn't been so much the focus of the Dads Matter HV team. However, I've gotten invited to um, share this work in different states. For example, I went to the state of Ohio, um, sort of caught the ear of um, one of their um, uh, government, uh, I'm forgetting which um, department it was, but just heard a talk on it and had this like moment of like, our policies in the state are actually pushing fathers out of families and especially low income um, fathers. So um, she then invited me to come to Ohio and give a talk uh, to the state folks there. And now they're thinking about um, some new policies to counter um, some of these um, some of these things in their state. Certainly here in Colorado, it feels like it's been a real um, state by state, system by system sort of a thing. And if you think about policies that impact fathers, a lot of it is at the state level. So it's really hard to think about like a a national policy opportunity in child welfare. We do have the CFSR um, that sets federal standards for child welfare work. And part of the, when states get evaluated or, or jurisdictions get evaluated on their work, one of the indicators is around father engagement. Um, and when they sort of fail on these indicators, they have to do a program improvement plan, a PIP. And almost every state has a PIP around improving father engagement. So the policy is there and there's a little bit of a, uh, teeth to it, and yet we're still not kind of moving the system along. So um, to answer your question, it hasn't really been my focus, and yet uh, all of this work um, is informing these different policy conversations and also illuminating where they fall short and where we need to think about some other approaches. But yeah, it's a really good question. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, I have a question coming in virtually on this iPad. Okay. For people interested in doing intervention work, where would you recommend they start? Ooh. I, I think that um, figuring out who your partners and collaborators are going to be um, is a great place to start. So um, Neil was a great thought partner for me, um, but also uh, the community agencies that I worked with in Chicago and the fathers and the mothers and the service providers. Um, you know, I like to say I have some good ideas, but I don't have all the ideas. So I need to widen my circle to figure that out. And I know like you, um, Kim, in your work, I always think of your hackathon, your homelessness hackathon. I think about building the collaborative change framework and the breakthrough series collaborative. These are all mechanisms really to widen our opportunity to think together as a community. So yet again, getting us out of the little scholarly individual box and having those conversations, I think is, is a great place to start. If this is someone, I'm not sure who's asking the question, but um, you know, leaning on your your practice experience, if you have that, um, exposing yourself to a lot of different types of interventions. So this is another thing I think early on when I was thinking about intervention work, I was thinking about 
child family parenting interventions because that's what I wanted. So that is what I read and that's what I focused on. But some of the most innovative, interesting ideas have come out of going to hear a talk in engineering or going to listen to somebody in the arts because expanding again those opportunities for creativity and holding space for it is where the magic often for me has happened so so all of those i think would be great places to start oh. hello that's too loud <laughs> um thank you for your talk again um and uh i didn't hear you <laughs> Um, the thing that I'm bringing up, I think is more of a comment and commentary and maybe a discussion, but, um, what I found most interesting about your talk was about, um, the intact versus and not versus, but that finally in research, they, they were putting together some within evidence-based, it seems it's more uh, well-rounded now than maybe it was uh, when you were first getting into it. But um, I think it's interesting that you started one of, probably one of the four, four women of that. Um, because I think, and then the second part of that, which is um, how, how can we say that this is, social workers are not, research based when we come from social systems mm -hmm. as our, a much of our base and when I went to school here it was integrative practice that mm -hmm. I went for so some of this does not seem that new but I know that social workers are often um, criticized for not being research based and I I had never really understood that very well and I I'm not sure if we're I liked how you used social work and social welfare, because that ties us to science. Welfare, social work just says, oh, we go around saying, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I see your letters there, but that's not what we do. We go and we try to figure out process therapy itself is that intact and flex in a way. Mm -hmm. Being a clinician is definitely that. Um, and I think that sometimes even they said it in, in class when we were just really new at this, um, that, um, that we weren't really promoting uh, anything or we weren't really promoting ourselves as a profession enough so that people were really clear about what has happened here in the last 50 years or 100 years. Maybe because it's women-based, um, uh, one of my favorite professors, Dr. Ina Cox, and many of you probably know of her um, and her work. And she was really based in, well, we'll do some research thing, but we're not gonna get lost in that as far as um, social workers that we, we're not already doing. So uh, along this line anyway, um, one last comment is that social media if you if you watch commercials or you watch some of the things going on, I think that we're not winning the battle as far as family or women and men together being co-parents, being co-responsibility and all that. If I I just kind of got sad because I saw a commercial where the woman was just with the infant. And it it was, it seemed like it was promoting this thing. It wasn't really about single parent. It, you didn't get that feeling anyway. You got the feeling that this is what this is and this is what this will be. And we will be dictated to about that. So I wondered your comments, everyone's comments, anybody who um, has found yeah. uh, You raise a, a lot of issues. I'll, I'll maybe focus in on one of them, which is that it doesn't seem like that new of a conversation. <laughs> so the evidence-based practice, and I would agree. Um, I mean, I remember learning about Mary Richmond and you know how she brought research evidence into practice and all about the legitimacy of social work and 
um, challenges, you know, Abraham Flexner, a bunch of these conversations that kind of emerge in different ways and different um, times and, and moments, but, but a lot of the, the key themes are kind of the same, you know. Um, I, I'm hopeful that, um, that, you know, we're sort of getting over it as social workers um, and that we are steadfast in our um, values and what we're trying to achieve um, and not spend a lot of energy and defensiveness um, and just do really good work. And I think that's um, the key. And otherwise it feels like kind of a distraction or use of energy that's not it freaked me out when I first learned about these things. And then I like sort of had to get over that and just and just focus on again, like what what brought me um, into this work and stay centered upon that and you know, disciplines or judginess that might be out there you can let it go because that's not really what what we're after in this work. Okay, I have a question I, we might want to end on, but if anybody has anything, raise your hand after this. So I can't get out of my mind this picture of the like windowless cement basement office. I just want to like come back to that a little bit and say, if you were to redesign the space necessary to do really good community engaged intervention research, how would it look different than them? Well, <laughs> Can I just add to your visual because that is the furniture is also black and thick and the lighting is like fluorescent and so I would all I just like turn off the lights and like just have a lamp in there it was great for taking naps so like amazing um that is such a convender yeah, question, it's a by metaphor. the way. I love a metaphor, but it sounds to me like that was a bit isolating and yeah, inspiring. It, it was totally. And and actually, um, Jeff and I were chatting um, about the change in the way people are coming together or, or not coming together in spaces like this. And I know we have people joining us online as well, but um, I think your question is particularly poignant in this moment of time because we're still trying to figure out like how do we make connection happen? How do we build and maintain relationships um, over small boxes and Zoom and, and things like that? Well, very flexible and I you know have kids and responsibilities and I sort of enjoy doing stuff, you know, from my home office. Um, I do think we're we're missing something. So then, expanding that out into the broader community. I'm working right now with a group of colleagues in education and psychology, playing around with this idea of a what would a community-based research practice and teaching center look like? Because even just like makes me think of today, we're giving this talk in Craig Hall and the University of Denver. Parking's kind of a pain in the neck. The doors are locked. I'm like trying to look for, like this isn't it either. <laughs> So what could that look like? And I, we probably need a hackathon for it or something like that to think because my, my mental boxes are too small. So when, only when we can kind of put those pieces together, could we come up probably with something that you and I couldn't do on our own, but I think that's what it's going to take. And it's going to look probably really different than anything that we did before. So. Excellent. Well, thank you, Jen. Can we have one more round of applause? Thank you. And please, everyone, stick around. There's food and drinks in the back and a chance to chat. And congratulations.